we'll talk about clustered applications and how it can benefit us. So uh, Aruna will take that section. And we'll have the uh, demo for this in the end. Thank you. Containers can give us uh, portability, isolation. It's lightweight. So it makes sense that we use it in many different ways. And um, ironically enough, if you look around us, we see that all most applications are getting clustered. So you have more and more clustered applications. So what we need to do here is uh, figure out how to get con containers working well in clustered environments. So to start off, let's look at uh, what is it that defines clustered applications. So when you look at uh, any clustering, right, what is the first thing you need there? Um, so you have multiple instances, application instances. So these instances need to talk to each other, which means you need some kind of an interface. So essentially, you need networking. And um, so along with that, you have uh, you do clustering. And one of the benefits of, uh, of that is availability. So you're getting better availability and failover as well. Um, so what else? Uh, like. Uh, when you have clusters, along with availability, you also need some kind of load balancing. So you want to make sure your, that your different application instances are, are getting equal or similar kind of traffic. Um, so another aspect of uh, clustering is that, uh, so let's say you have like a really huge cluster of 100 applications. Or you want to run 100 instances. So w what do you want? You want to be able to replicate the service across those multiple instances. So essentially, you're looking for some kind of service replication. And uh, the last of all is orchestration. So the moment you have this really large clusters, you want to able, you want this synchronization mechanism where the whole cluster can be brought up or brought down in one go or uh, do multiple other things within your cluster. So if you look at it, what we are trying to achieve here is along with the isolation of uh, containers, we are trying to get clustering work. So clustering in tandem with isolation. Um, so let's see what uh, like a very simplistic container cluster would look like. So to start off, I have, say, a bunch of containers. I bring it together to form a cluster. So I have a cluster now of containers. And now, uh, each of these containers can actually be on multiple physical hosts. So it need not be on the same host, actually. So essentially, this is one mechanism where you can get better availability. So along with this, um, so you're actually, your physical host could actually be on across uh, multiple cloud platforms. And it could also be on a data center. So this is kind of what we are trying to get at, create an application instance which is a clustered uh, container. So what I'll be doing here is, um, in the next few slides, I'll take, take each of the features that we have defined. So each feature, and how does it fit into a, a container, clustered container? So, um, so in fact, specifically, the Docker world, actually. So most of what I would talk is, um, like when we were looking at uh, Aerospike, using Aerospike, which is a distributed database, so most of what we, uh, what I've shown here in the next few slides is from our experience in getting it working in uh, Docker, so the la latest swarm mode of Docker specifically. So the first thing that I'll talk of, like we've seen how we uh, clustered applications uh, make sense when you have orchestration in it. So first and foremost, if uh, to get orchestration in containers, um, so what are we looking at to do orchestration? So essentially, we, we want some mechanism to create and destruct containers. So you want the whole cluster to be able to come up in one go, probably. Along with that, you're looking at uh, service discovery, networking, load balancer. So all of these are what your orchestration tools should give you. So interestingly, I realized that our uh, conference room is called Harmony. So it looks like uh, with orchestration tools, we might be on the road to Harmony as well. So when you look at the tools that you have in the market, I mean, we have quite a few of these besides the three listed. Um, so, But a lot of them have actually caught up, like the new swarm mode of Docker. 
has uh, come up on par, pretty much on par with Kubernetes. So a lot of the features are uh, like available as well in the, uh, Docker now. And along with that, uh, Marathon has been around for a while, this Mesos Marathon. Uh, so essentially, you can choose uh, the tool you need. I mean, I think it would depend on the maturity of the tool as well as uh, what your specific needs are. So like I mentioned, I would be talk specifically focusing on the swarm mode of Docker. So uh, this one, this is like the latest uh, release from Docker 1.12 onwards. So prior to Docker 1.12, a lot of the features were missing. But with swarm mode, uh, they have kind of come on, on par with uh, the late, uh, a lot of features, actually. They've added a lot of features to it. Like for instance, you have uh, uh, an inherent multi-host networking. So essentially, you have uh, multiple hosts in your swarm. And the swarms can talk to each other just as you bring it up. So along with that, they've added uh, service discovery, load balancing, and security. So all of these will come to you as you create your swarm. And besides that, there are uh, like production or deployment-related aspects like uh, doing rolling upgrades or scaling. So if you want to scale your uh, applic application instances or service instances, uh, you can do that, as well as state reconciliation. Uh, state reconciliation is actually quite interesting because it's what it says is that if you have a desired state, like say my desired state is to have five instances running, your swarm is working in the background, making sure that you always have five instances running. So that's kind of a, a nice addition specifically in production-like environments. Um, so this is like the basics of swarm mode. Uh, so when we see all the features of Swarm uh, and the Swarm mode specifically, what you have here is uh, specifically like it's more catered to a set of applications. Like for applications like web servers, it can work pretty much out of the box. But uh, when I'm looking at specific applications, like in our case, we were uh, interested in uh, making uh, like creating a cluster of. Uh, a distributed database. So in that case, we realized that there were certain challenges. And uh, sometimes there were fine tuning or workarounds possible. And most of what we would talk of is based on our uh, experience in that area. So let's look at the first, uh, like we saw orchestration. And now the next thing, like the most basic aspect of clustering is networking. So if you look at a container cluster, so this is kind of what we want to have. Uh, so you have three containers. So this could be a web server uh, service, which has three instances running. And uh, so the three together should be able to talk to each other. So they form a network. So it's kind of, it could be an isolated network. So when you have this network, you need some ability to talk to the external world. So that could be your published port. So you have a port which you publish, and you talk through it to the external world. So what we have here shows that it's on a single Docker host, but that's not really the case. I mean, you could have your containers across hosts. So I have a demo later where you can see that uh, your containers could be across multiple hosts. Um, so th this is kind of what we want our container cluster to look like. Uh, so when we look at uh, what Docker gives us, so Docker, the networking part uh, aspect of Docker, so by default, it gives you quite a few things. Like for instance, it gives you the host network. So you can use your underlying uh, subsystem host network as well. And then it gives you a bridge network. So bridge is like an interface between the two. And third is uh, an overlay network. So th there was a session in the morning on overlay networks. I think a, a few of you might have attended. So essentially, it gives you uh, overlay is a network which is created over your existing network. So I can say that I have a set of containers which work within this uh, network. So uh, the swarm mode of Docker, that's the newest uh, release, it's creating an uh, overlay network for you. So this is essentially what aids your multi-host networking. And the last is it also gives you the ability to publish ports. 
So this is what we already have with Docker. Specifically, some of it is from the Swarm mode. So when we see multi-host networking, right? So what are we trying to have? Like, what does Swarm give you in terms of a uh, uh, network layer? So what we have here is that in your Swarm, you can have multiple managers, so multiple masters, as well as multiple worker nodes. So these managers are uh, responsible for your entire Swarm. But if you see, you have three managers, but your leader is chosen by the Raft consensus group. And uh, so this is the manager. Let's say this is your chosen leader. So your le leader is the one who is keeping track of all the containers and creation and destruction as well. It has access to a, a key value store. This is a key value store which keeps track of the service, the container information, the, all the coordination between them. So essentially, everything happens through your leader, which makes sure that uh, your entire cluster is working as one. So this is like a very basic uh, network overview of uh, networking in Swarm. So between the worker nodes, they use a gossip protocol to keep track of, like, say, a worker node has come in, a worker node has gone out. So they keep track of all of this through the, uh, in their interactions with the other worker nodes. Um, so this is like a basics of uh, how a uh, swarm looks like. Um, so what I've, uh, like, like I mentioned, I mean, a lot of these things were based on what uh, we found missing in Docker. Like, for instance, uh, uh, like when we're trying to uh, use Aerospike in uh, Docker, a couple of things were, like a few of these have been addressed now. Like, for instance, you don't need to create a manual network anymore because it comes with your swarm creation. Secondly, security is also there. Like, you have a TLS enabled by, as your swarm is created. But the one missing part was multicast because, uh, like, if you look at applications like Elasticsearch and Aerospike, so uh, they have an option to use multicast. And uh, this is actually a very powerful feature. Right, because it gives you auto discovery. So I, my whole cluster would uh, auto discover the others within the cluster. So it gives you a very powerful feature. So because it's not there by default in uh, Docker, we had to use a third party driver, Weave. So this gave, uh, Weave gives you the ability to use multicast and that was one way to overcome multicast. Uh, the, the need for multicast, basically. So this was like the networking challenges that we had. I mean, another one is probably the multi-cloud platforms. So essentially, if you're trying to do something like this, so maybe you have to change your design, like probably uh, have them running in two different clusters and talk through a published port. So, but there are definitely, you have to realize that it'll add latency. That's going to be the key part of multi-cloud platforms. So uh, what we have seen is that uh, when you're using containers um, in applications like distributed databases, a very key aspect is persistence. You want statefulness. And when you look at containers, they are stateless. So that's like a paradox. We are trying to get add persistence where there is no uh, statelessness. I mean, there, when there is statelessness in, a, in the container. So to do that, uh, you can add external volumes, so you can attach an external volume. So to add persistence, like let's say I have a uh, MySQL database, so I'm trying to create a cluster of MySQL. Uh, in that case, I can add persistence. So I uh, attach, when I create my service MySQL, I attach the volume. So I attach a volume which has, which uses my file system, like the host file system. So essentially, this is what will uh, be accessed within my container. So this is my containers uh, mounted on this path within the container. And one of these is your uh, actual uh, location where your uh, persistence is done. Um, so this is uh, like uh, one way of persisting data. Um, but when we look at, like in Aerospike, we had this uh, 
uh, need for SSD. So what happens is that Aerospike is optimized for SSD devices, and its real power is unleashed when you use raw SSD devices. So we had to find a way to get this working. So one way was to use an external device, so use the option device, which uh, gives you access to a raw SSD, and it's mounted within a path inside your container. So uh, getting durability and persistence working in distributed databases was possible with all these mechanisms. So we've seen uh, like orchestration and durability. So these are like networking as well as durability, key aspects of creating a cluster. So the next as uh, like, so when you're looking at um, production environments, you want to create your cluster, let's say, in production, and you have certain key requirements for availability. Like for instance, in our case, uh, in creating a distributed database, we had some specific uh, requirements. Like let's say, at a very minimal level, I want to make sure that if I have a swarm of five physical hosts, there should be at least one instance running on each of these hosts. So how do I do that? I can use the mode as global, set the mode global when I run the service, and I, it will make sure there is one instance on every host. Uh, in fact, the demo which comes, which is following, has, this, has an option of this. Uh, so you, will, you can see it, actually, that it's actually creating um, instance on every physical host. And some of the other uh, like need we had was, say, storage. I wanted to make sure that uh, I have a constraint as storage. Like, uh, my container is only getting created on a host which has SSD uh, devices. So that was another uh, aspect. Like, similarly, you can add other constraints. Like I say, you, you only start containers uh, in when the region is US, or you can add similar such constraints. So you can add rules and constraints to define where your containers will come up on. Um, so along with availability is load balancing. I mean, when you look at uh, the load balancing you get in swarm mode, so it gives you a lot of these things uh, by default now. So the moment you publish a port, that becomes your entry point. And through that, the load is balanced to all the various uh, instances inside your uh, application. Uh, so it makes sure that uh, it, the load is balanced. I mean, when you look at what you have here, it's like a pretty primitive form of load balancing. So it gives you a, a like a DNS round robin, a virtual IP-based load balancing. And it's using that ingress routing mesh. So the ingress mesh is what is created. The overlay network is created between all your different uh, hosts, containers on the host, and that's what it uses to load balance across the swarm. So uh, what we see here, like what we have is a basic form of load balancing, but uh, if you're really looking for some different kind of mechanism, I mean what you have, you can add an extra layer, but it's going to be like an overhead for you as well. So some of the caveats we noticed was that, and the other thing is, um, like if I look at load balancing, I mean specifically in the case of uh, Elasticsearch or Aerospike. Um, so Elasticsearch has a coordinating node which knows uh, where you to query the data from. So similarly, Aerospike has a smart client. And the smart client knows exactly where your key is residing, which node to pick the key from. So what happens is that uh, Having a load balancer is essentially counterproductive, which means that uh, I probably want to turn it off. I want a mechanism to turn it off or change my design. So essentially, this is like um, maybe one way was to expose all the ports. So one way we were thinking is expose all the ports within the cluster and give direct access. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is still an open aspect that uh, having a default load balancer may not necessarily be good. So sometimes you might want to turn it off as well. Um, so I guess the quote is there for that reason, because it's still an open area as well. And um, so what we've seen so far is like, um, uh, like uh, I mean, it hasn't really, uh, we have talked of a number of things. But when you look at production deployments, 
uh, there were a number of things we're looking for. Like for instance, if I have a production environment, I want uh, like say the SSD devices to be used. But if I'm using a QA environment, I'll use the file system because it saves me cost. Uh, like it's less expensive to use. So another um, production related need was upgrades. So if I want to run an upgrade, I can set a update delay time. So I can say, uh, up, uh, do the upgrade, but stagger for 10 seconds between every upgrade. So in, another aspect is like say validation checks. Like in the case, if you want to, say in the case of Elasticsearch, so if you want to bring up the container, before that you do certain checks, like make sure your shards are up, uh, do a certain minimum level of checks before you or start or join the cluster. So that's a very interesting aspect where you can add your own shell scripts at the entry point. Besides that, you can also do some uh, basic health checks in your Docker file, so you can add some monitoring as well. Um, so what we've seen so far is like multiple ways to get your swarm up, but um, what you're doing is you'll, you have to use like large commands, large clunky commands, aim it at the, com use it on your command line interface. Uh, so you can get your swarm up, but it's not going to be easy. So what you can do instead is use a compose file. So your a compose file has uh, all your definitions of your cluster. And using that, the whole swarm gets created. You aim it at the swarm, and the whole swarm is created by uh, uh, the swarm uh, by the swarm itself. So the rest of it is the same that you have your swarm managers who take care of the swarm. So it's only the deployment ease of getting a cluster up. So the last aspect of uh, Compose is that uh, they've come up with a new interesting feature called bundles and stacks. Uh, I mean, um, if it's like it's very akin to a Docker file creating an image. So we just saw how I have a Docker file. I, cre I create an image, and with that image, I create a container. So in a similar way, I use a compose file. I create a bundle, and with that bundle, I create a stack. So essentially, now I'm looking at portability at the stack level, like the whole cluster level. So this is a very interesting feature. It's still in experimental mode, but a lot of things are missing as well. If you look at the GitHub issues, there are quite a few things yet to be added. But uh, it's definitely something to watch out for. Um, so what we've seen here in terms of clustering is just a subset of the problems we had, like specific to, say, distributed databases or some of our experiences. But I'm sure many of you would have dis different kinds of needs. And uh, essentially, at the end, the end goal is to get it working for your application, make it work well for your application. So figuring out workarounds, getting it to work is going to, is a very important aspect of clustering as well. Um, so we have a demo. I think we do have some time for the demo here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so our demo, uh, did you all have any questions? We can, I think we can take questions right now before the demo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so actually when you look at it, right, the swarm manager itself gives you a lot of monitoring. So it's doing like, for instance, the state reconciliation is saying that I will ensure there are five instances running at any point. So that kind of uh, first level check they are doing. I mean, when you look at production environments, some of the basic things is I want my instances to be running. So that kind of check is happening at the swarm manager level itself. So besides that, you can add external monitoring. So your application level monitoring can all come externally over and above this. But at the infrastructure level, as the swarm manager is doing a lot of things. I mean, if you look at Kubernetes, it does something similar. So they are doing a lot of things for you inherently now, actually. So for managing, for example, for managing your uh, VMware, we have vCenter, right, which basically takes care of the stuff and all, right? Just quoting an example. Uh, similarly, uh, for Hyper-V, we have Hyper-V Manager or System Center. Similarly, for managing containers altogether, right? Uh, whether it's a clustered apps or it's a normal container that you want to cre create, 
uh, we have these tools, orchestration tools. So Kubernetes, uh, Marathon, uh, Docker, Swan, all these are the tools basically which gives you that functionality of managing and as well as monitoring. So the monitoring will be at the application monitoring level, at the host so monitoring level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can add plugins as well to monitor it. Now, I hope that yeah, answered that. Answer. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So I will show you. I have a demo where you can see that uh, the instance. If I say I have two instances, I start off with two instances. I scale it up to five. It makes sure that my desired state of five will always be there. So that's what it does for you in the background. So your swarm is, it's working in the background to make sure you have your desired state at any point. So I mean, and off to. Add to that, I don't know if that's really good all the time. Like, if I was going to be paranoid, I would say I want to probably check how my instances look before I even get it up. So those are things you have to figure out at your application point of view. But from uh, the Swarm perspective, it's giving you a lot of these things. Yeah. So when you look at it, I mean, a lot of these are production-related aspects, right? Like you have. Uh, uh, like uh, you can scale, dynamic scaling is available. Then you can do um, like this whole state reconciliation is a very useful part of uh, like uh, production environments. And then um, a lot of these are like really gearing towards production. I mean, you're, you're making it easier for a DevOps person to be uh, like to look at creating the cluster and not so much as constantly monitoring it actually. Uh, yeah, uh, I had a question. You said uh, Docker's are stateless. I mean, containers are stateless. And yes. you said for persistence, you had to add a file system. File system. So now, uh, for a, in a clustered setup, so okay. you'll be actually duplicating mm. file systems across. So in a container uh, failover, yeah. um, how does it know? Uh, you Which know how? File yeah, yeah. Correct. So the file system states change. So now you need to manage the file system via clustering in yeah. a different layer. So how does? So Docker to file uh, yeah, storage correct, file yeah. system interaction work in so terms of clustering. Yeah, so what it does is it really comes up and it will take the first uh, the uh, volume which was unattached, like attached to the previous container. But for that reason, I would I mean I would say that maybe that's not what you want to do, like not do on the fly. So then you can add an entry point check to make sure you check before you get into make sure that this is what I. Like the file system is probably usable, or do I want to attach to so it? We're so. not using a container in a container sense if we are going for external. Uh, so that's the storage, thing, right? right? I mean, if you want to make it work for your application, like d databases needs persistence. Yes, yes. So you have no uh, like that's that's a pretty basic requirement. So in that sense, you have to make it work in different ways. Yeah. So based on the scenario, so if it is a very initial scenario where you are just looking at uh, testing out something, it's it's not a huge environment, like not a database requirement and all, because database really depends on the performance of the disk, right? It has to have a disk, like kind of an SSD disk, which really gives it, it a performance so that whenever you are accessing the database, it's giving you that kind of uh, output. So it really ma depends. If you are building an environment like you said, okay, so you have to change it accordingly. So definitely containers, uh, as we said, so containers are definitely useful for those people who do not want to rebuild everything from the beginning and who do not want uh, the performance hiccups to stop them from working on something which they are working on. Because uh, we all know, because we all must be working on virtual machines, uh, cloud environments, because in the cloud also we use virtual machines only. So the compute that we talk is virtual machines. So we know the challenges of a virtual machine. So if you, if you see it from this angle, uh, we have in, in Windows, we have Windows Server, which is the normal with GUI and all. And we have Windows Core, which is without GUI. What's the purpose of the bringing core? The purpose was performance. Because to run that GUI packages, it used to ta take that much of time. So that's where container is useful. So to decrease the heaviness of the container itself, it is just a compiled version of your application, which basically you can develop, test, run anywhere. So build it once ship it and run it anywhere. So that is basically the core line for dockers or containers, right? 
so you it really depends now again as i am saying there is a difference between virtual machines and containers right so it is up to the scenario which one to go with not all the scenarios would require you to go with containers right somewhere there might be a requirement that hey no containers are fine but i still want my os updates i still want the os to be managed by me i i don't want to replace that layer by anything so that's where you have to make a decision whether which way to go but this is something which is definitely easing your life in lot of ways as uh, there was a question on devops so devops definitely it's easing the life of people it's basically helping you to maintain the entire cycle yeah, you have yeah. a question uh, so is there virtual storage in terms of containers not no it does have some storage like it's yeah. not like uh, but the fact is that when your container is actually uh, destroyed it goes away like it's okay. like ephemeral storage in like in aws world yeah, yeah. yeah. ma'am i have a couple of questions uh, we are trying to uh, dockerize our application okay uh, uh, using windows server port so we have done that in a um, uh, on prem desktop we have okay. done okay. can i run this uh, container directly in um, uh, aws ec cloud or uh, uh, g cloud based yeah yeah yeah. So, yeah you can yes, run it yes, actually yes yeah, yeah. that's so, correct and that's the advantage actually so you have created it on some platform yeah. and uh, you can run it on yes. ec2 because there are old uh, our desktop based windows services which was running which we have uh, dockerized it so which means that i can run on correct. Clou uh, cloud application as a cloud application and expose in any port Correct. So, yeah, I mean, I'm assuming you would have used a VM virtual box on the, your Windows machine. So what? Okay. So, so uh, that's um, what your. You know, uh, we we have tried with the latest Windows Server Core okay. release. Okay. 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 Core release. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. Container. Uh, so question number two is uh, uh, the Nano Server which uh, yeah. Microsoft has released uh, doesn't support installers. Correct. We cannot install anything. So all our Windows based application predominantly needs two things: a .NET and VC redistribution. Is there a plan that uh, Nano Server official image with these two things uh, Microsoft will release? Okay, so, so <laughs> no, I think I can also <laughs> not answer. <laughs> so, uh, good question actually. So, if we talk about so for those of you uh, who doesn't know about Nano Servers, uh, we have uh, recently uh, launched or released something called as Nano Servers. Uh, if uh, someone on any one of you had worked on uh, Windows Core Server Core. Uh, that was a very small uh, version of uh, Windows Server without GUI. You have to manually install the roles which are required by you. Similarly, so Nano Server, the footprint is very small, very, very small. It only supports 26 roles. You cannot go beyond 26 roles right now. Uh, for answering your question, the plan of bringing those things currently, it might be in the roadmap because it's just released I think in October only so we just released it on in October but uh, definitely I think uh, nano server uh, will come up with these kind of roles but I'm not sure when but definitely there would be a plan or it, they will be in the roadmap so one last question. yeah uh, is this containers are platform agnostic platform agnostic well, what do you specifically mean by platform so agnostic Absolutely, that's what, yeah, absolutely. Because when we talk about these containers, so uh, th this is a myth actually that uh, uh, when Windows came up with this container thing, it might, be a some, it might be some different type of containers. It's not the different type of containers. It's the same container that Linux had with them. So that's just the terminology is changed, okay? We are taking the same kind of packages and putting it in the Windows server. So we just install that role of container. So you had worked, so we have a role now in Windows uh, Server Manager, we have a role of containers. We just check it, put that role, and start creating the containers. If you see the commands also in Windows Server, it's same commands, not, not changed. So you can definitely ship it to Linux containers. Uh, I hope that's OK. Uh, so my question was on the service replication and isolation that you spoke of. Okay. Uh, so while I understood the service replication part, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on how the isolation works. Uh, and I had a follow-up to that. Uh, so suppose we ran an application 
uh, with the purpose of uh, replicating the service. Mm -hmm. uh, if we ran it as multiple instances of a process, which would be our traditional approach, mm -hmm. versus running it, uh, say, within a container for the purpose of replication, mm -hmm. how would it be different, better, and easier? So first is your ease, ease of uh, portability. So like I have an image. I just use it. I, it comes like if I if you've seen the demo, I just pull the image. It comes up in a minute. So I can do that as many instances. And when I look at the swarm mode, right? I have a demo here actually. So I create the service. So I create uh, the service here. So when I create the service, right? I'm creating a service here. So at this point, I just say that I have I want the service running. And later on, I, I, te I can tell like how many instances do I want to run. So essentially, I'm not doing the actual replication. I'm just uh, defining what my service is. And then I, I tell how many instances I want it to run. So this, the swarm is doing it for you in uh, the background because it's easy. I have an image. I just replicate it that many times across multiple. I bring up a container, has this image running on it. And you have it up and running. It's really fast and quick because, uh, like, even from if you're doing versus doing it, uh, I mean, I don't think we do it manually anymore with orchestration tools. But uh, here you have your container coming up with the instance right away. So you're not doing any of the hard work itself. So I'll just keep the demo running. I mean, if anyone has any questions on the demo or any other uh, wants to see it, you can definitely get in touch with us. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Pamela. Thanks a lot, Aruna. Thank